right after the children's sermon, Michelle looked at me and pointed to a long gospel reading and said, have fun with that. <laughs> and then I just stood there while Taylor stood up to read it and she got a good laugh out of it. Um, do I wonder why Taylor read it? Because it was really long. <laughs> and Taylor's good at reading. So, um, sorry, that's, that's all. Um, okay. So, it's an exciting day today. It's Confirmation Sunday. We're going to confirm four, uh, four of our middle schoolers. And I've asked them to pick out verses. What's their favorite verse? And they're going to tell us in two to three sentences why they picked this verse. And I remember the verse that I picked uh, from Genesis so, oh, so many years ago. But now if I had it to do over again, I might take John 21, verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Such a perfect verse. <laughs> so for the last couple weeks, um, we've been saying, he is risen. And then you all say, he is risen indeed. Today I want to say, are you sure? How do you know that he is risen indeed? Uh, we believe our faith is a gift from the Holy Spirit, but how is it that we make sense of it? If someone were to ask you, what makes you so sure that Jesus is risen? How would you respond? How would you explain what you believe? Uh, I think the resurrection stories help us. The resurrection stories help us to explain what it is that we believe and why we believe it. The uh, gospel reading last week was Thomas. Thomas, uh, who, uh, who told the other disciples that I will not believe unless I can see his wounds and touch them. And so Jesus showed up a week later and Thomas was able to see the wounds and to touch them. Uh, today, the disciples are out fishing. They're out fishing 100 yards from shore. They haven't caught anything. You know, these disciples used to be fishermen. And they've taken a break for several years to follow Jesus. And now they go back out, now that Jesus has died, and they go back out fishing. They're not really sure what's going to happen to them. So they go back out fishing, and it's like they're out there all night, and they don't catch anything. And you just imagine Peter saying, man, I used to be good at this. That ever happened to you? Like taking 20 years off and trying to play softball? Man, I used to be good at this. I don't understand. And so they see a guy on the beach 100 yards away. And he says, so, you guys haven't caught any fish, have you? And frustratingly, they probably reply, no. What's it to you anyway? Right? And so the guy on the beach says, well, cast your nets on the other side. And so they do, and they catch 153 fish more than their nets could handle. And Peter is so excited by this abundance of fish that he puts his clothes on and jumps in the water and swims to the shore. Not quite sure why he just didn't have clothes on to begin with and just takes his boat in, but hey, it's not my school. <laughs> we might not have the same opportunity as Thomas to touch the wounds of Jesus, to see the wounds of Jesus. But I believe that God is still revealed to us in our abundance in the same way that God was revealed to them in that moment in the abundance of their fish. And so if someone were to say to you, why is it that you believe he is risen? We might respond with something that starts with, well, let me tell you about my abundance. Let me tell you about my abundance. Let me tell you about my blessings. Let me tell you about the good things in my life. And um, I guess we have to start with the most common place to start when we're talking about abundance. We have to start talking when we have an abundance of money and the stuff that money buys. We have an abundance of money and the stuff that money buys. Uh, I, um, I don't know about you, but I have... And I know this isn't a surprise, so let's not all pretend like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I have more pairs of shoes than I need. <laughs> you all know this, right? I assume most of you all have more shoes than you need as well. 
But every time I think about it, I think about this guy that I met when I was in Fiji working with Habitat for Humanity. In Fiji, the people who live in these villages only really have one pair of shoes if they're lucky. And they're not very good pairs of shoes. And when I was there, I brought three pairs of shoes and a pair of working boots. And I was working alongside this one guy. I would be in my boots every day, in my jeans, and my, you know, I'd have my tool belt that <laughs> kept snacks in. Um, <laughs> Um, if, you, if you've ever done handiwork with me, you just know that. I, anyway, I was going to carry the cinder blocks. Um, and, and this guy was working next to me barefoot. And at the end of the week, it just I, did, I saw our feet were about the same size, and I gave him my work boots. And it was as if I had just given him a million dollars. And I don't think we truly understand what kind of abundance we have. What kind of an abundance we have. Uh, we always know that there's someone else out there who has more than us, right? But we don't take the time to look and see about the people who have less than us. So here's some numbers that may surprise you. If you have $3,210 in net worth, you know, all your assets and all your debts, if you have $3,000, you are in the top half of all the people of the world as far as wealth. Which means for every one person who has more than you, there's someone who has less than you. If you have $68,000 in net worth, you know, your retirement, your, your equity in your house, everything. If you have $68,000, you are in the top 10% of the world. Which means for every one person who has more than you, nine people have less than you. And if you saved up and you're at a point where you have $760,000 in net worth. 760000 you are on the top 1% of the world. Which means for every one person who has more than you, 99 people have less than you. We, uh, we are a people of abundance. We have more than we need to get through each day. This is all a blessing from God. And what a blessing it is to know that in this world, there is enough for every person to have an abundance, to have more than they need. And that is something that we can work towards to make sure that the rest of the world sees what is possible. So we have an abundance of money and stuff that money buys. We have an abundance, more importantly, we have an abundance of grace. We have all the grace we can spend in a lifetime. We have all the grace that we could need in a lifetime. Today we have two stories of, of Jesus showing radical grace. The first is Peter. We all know the story of Peter after Jesus was arrested. Uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. Three times people said, no, you were with him. And he says, no, I don't know the guy. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not, follow I'm not a follower of him. And so Jesus in our text today says, Gee, Peter, do you love me? Because I still love you. I know you denied me, but I still love you. And I still want to work with you. And I still want to do great things together. We have Jesus showing grace to Peter. And then we have the story of Paul. I don't know about you, but when I woke up Easter Sunday, and, and I read the news, I saw the news, I saw about the bombing of the Christian church in Sri Lanka. I was incredibly saddened by that. Incredibly saddened by the fact that there are people out there who want to kill people, others based on their faith. Who want to kill others based on their beliefs. Who want to kill Christians. Well, that's who Paul was. That's what Paul did. The text says that he had murder on his mind. Paul wanted to go out and kill Christians because Paul had already killed Christians. And Jesus comes to Paul on the road to Damascus and says, Hey, I've got another job for you. I'm going to use you. You, the one who has killed my followers. Let me explain to you what grace is. So that you can write half of the New Testament and tell others about what grace is. And then I want you to travel around and I want you to start churches. And so Paul does that. If God can forgive Peter, and if God especially can forgive Paul, then God can certainly forgive each and every one of us and every single thing that we have done. We have an abundance 
of grace. We also have an abundance of strength. We have an abundance of strength, even though we may not always feel like it. So uh, as part of our stewardship campaign, we're going through our pillars. Last week we talked about growing, uh, growing in faith. Today we're talking about uplifting worship. And how when we come to worship, I truly hope that while you're here, that you feel God's presence. And that you feel uplifted. And that you feel God's strength. And that you are ready for life outside of these walls. The ups and the downs. And when you need to rely on God's strength, you know that it's there. You can lean on it. You can trust it. You can feel it. I had a uh, professor in seminary that I said once, are, are you ready for class today? And he said, no, I'm never ready. But the God inside me is always ready. And I thought, wow, that's powerful. To truly trust God. Trust in God's strength to get through each and every single day. We have God's strength to help us do things that others didn't think we can do. And if you want to, uh, to see a, a, an image of what that might look like, I just want you to turn your head to your right and to your left. Because we were told nine years ago that you could try starting a church, but I can tell you what, it ain't going to work. It does, people don't start with their churches anymore. Our bishop said that. Not our current bishop, our retired bishop. <laughs> And nothing but great support from our current bishop. <laughs> we have the power to overcome loss and change. We've all experienced loss in life. We've all experienced change. We've all been in those moments where we just don't know if we're ever going to experience joy in life again. We've all woken up and not, we're not sure how we're going to get through today. Because things are difficult. We've all had those moments where we think life is never going to be the same. There's a darkness, a fog. But slowly, the fog lifts. And our hope in God's promises help brings us through. This text in the Psalms today, weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. is such an important text for us. No matter what we're going through, and no matter how long the night is, we know that joy is coming. We know that joy is coming because we know how much we are loved by God. And so someone might ask us, how do you know he is risen? How do you know he came back from the dead? And I hope you think about your life for a minute and think, well, I can't imagine what life would be had he not risen. Amen. Um, 